making all the arrangements for you. So I will start uh, with. Uh, uh, so I will talk about an application of the uh, strong comparison princi principle for uh, the differential operator called, uh, namely the P Laplacian. So uh, I generally start my talk with a motivation for the kind of problems that uh, we work on. So this is based on the joint work with Mrityanjay Ghosh, who is a PhD student at IIT Madras in India. Yeah. Shall we start? Sure. Okay, so the plan is as follows. I will start with the motivation uh, for the uh, motivation about the kind of problems that we work on. And those problems are uh, uh, called shape optimization problems. I will introduce what I mean by the shape optimization problem. And I will quickly just mention one example of the shape optimization problems. That is the isoperimetric problem. And uh, as Rajesh said, I work on isoperimetric inequalities in mathematical physics. Uh, so in this talk, I will just focus my attention on a few eigenvalue optimization problems over a given uh, family of domains. I will introduce uh, each and every term that comes over here. Then I will state the main results, uh, sketch the key steps in the proof. Uh, the key steps are namely the shape calculus step, uh, the moving plane method, when I have a linear operator and uh, uh, when I have a circular uh, do domain, in, I will, I will uh, talk about it in a rotating plane method when the domain is not circular, but it has a dihedral symmetry. And uh, when in the linear case, we use the maximum principle, but when the differential operator is nonlinear, then we use the comparison principles to uh, uh, derive the result uh, that we want to prove. Then I will support my uh, results by numerical evidence. And uh, then we'll end with a list of re relevant uh, references. Okay, so uh, these are the, from what we see around us, uh, we tend to ask questions like why are small water droplets and bubbles that float in air are approximately spherical? Why does a herd of reindeer form a circle if attacked by bulls? Uh, why does a cat fold her body to form an almost round shape on a cold night? Can we hear the shape of a drum? That means if there is a drum playing in the next room, just from the sound of the drum, can we guess what, what shape the drum might have? Uh, and of all geometric figures having a certain property, which one has the greatest area or volume? And a similar question is, of all geometric figures having a certain property, which one has the least perimeter or surface area? And mathematicians have been uh, trying to answer these questions via what are called as uh, shape optimization problems. So as the name suggests, uh, shape optimization problem, uh, typical problem is to find the shape which is optimal. So what do I mean by optimal here? It means that in the sense that it minimizes a certain cost functional while satisfying given constraint. So there is a cost that is involved and there is some goal that we, we have in mind. So in order to achieve that goal, what is the cost uh, that one has to pay and how to minimize that cost. So mathematically speaking, it is to find a domain that minimizes, suppose I call the cost functional, give it a uh, name J omega, then I want to minimize this J omega and I can formulate that constraint that I have on this omega in mathematically in the form that J omega is equal to zero. So in other words, it's just to minimize the functional J omega over so, uh, the collection of all the omegas for which G omega is zero. I will just call them all the admissible domains and put them in a family uh, called script F. And I will just minimize this J omega over this admissible family of domains, uh, which is essentially finding an omega star in the same family for which the cost is the value is minimum. Uh, in many cases, the functional that J that we are trying to minimize, they depend on the solution of a differential equation. And this differential equation is defined on variable domains. So the moment the domain changes, the solution changes and the functional which depends on the solution also change. So we want to find in order to, so that is the uh, dependence on the domain in, in case of a partial differential equation. Uh, so this is the connection of between shape optimization problem and partial differential equation. Okay. 
So uh, an example of shape optimization problem is the classical isoperimetric problem where we need to enclose a given uh, area capital A, positive number capital A, with the shortest possible curve. Okay, and uh, here uh, the cost that we are trying to minimize is the perimeter of the domain omega and the constraint is area of omega minus A is zero. Uh, the classical theorem asserts that uh, in the Euclidean plane, this problem has a solution. It, it has a unique solution and the solution is a circle that is among all the domains enclosing the uh, given area capital A, circle will have the shortest possible curve and circle is the only solution of this. So the existence and uniqueness of solution to the isoperimetric problem. And uh, this property of the circle can be expressed in the form of an inequality, which is called an isoperimetric inequality, which says that uh, among all uh, uh, piecewise, uh, for any piecewise simple, uh, piecewise smooth simple closed curve, that means that it shouldn't have self-intersection. And uh, we are talking about planar curves here. So any piecewise smooth simple closed curve C in a plane whose arc length is L, and suppose it encloses area A, then perimeter square is always larger than or equal to four pi times the area. And this inequality becomes an equality if and only if C is a circle of radius root A by pi. So this is both uh, iso, so as the name suggests, isoperimetric should ideally suggest among all the domains having the same perimeter. But in the statement, we are always taking the area to be constant. So we are talking about the ISO area problems. But uh, because of this inequality, it is not difficult to see that the ISO area problem is equivalent to the ISO perimetric problem. That is, if you fix the area and uh, then the perimeter square has a lower bound in terms of the area, and that lower bound is attained if and only if uh, the inequality becomes equality, and that is precisely the case where it is the circle and when you fix the perimeter that is the isoperimetric problem then uh, the area enclosed by that curve has an upper bound and that upper bound is attained if and only if this inequality becomes an equality and that that is precisely the case where your c is a circle and it's the unique solution because the inequality becomes equality if and only if it's a circle so there are many other reasons like isoperimetric problem uh, which are uh, of a similar nature and uh, then uh, they are referred to as isoperimetric in inequality of mathematical physics and they are useful in uh, physics and many other contexts uh, where we try to find the extremum of uh, various quantities which are of uh, physical significance such as the torsional rigidity uh, eigenvalues of a differential equation, uh, differential operator, energy functional, heat content, etc. Uh, they are shown to be extremal for a circular or a spherical domain, but not always, not necessarily always, but generally they are shown to be extremal for the most symmetric configuration that is possible in that uh, particular admissible family of domains. Okay, so for example, the celebrated Faber-Kran theorem, which was proved by Faber and Kran uh, independently in the year 1923 and 25 respectively. Uh, which states that amongst all domains with fixed volume, the ball minimizes the first Dirichlet eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Uh, I will explain what I mean by the first Dirichlet eigenvalue of the Laplacian, but uh, think of this as some cost functional associated with the boundary value problem. So mathematically speaking, it just says that if uh, this cost functional uh, is uh, minimized when the domain becomes a ball, and this is among all the domains uh, for which the volume is constant. Okay, and it also says that the equality holds if and only if omega is equal to b. So like the isoperimetric inequality, there is also an inequality here, which becomes equality if and only if your domain is a, a ball. And the admissible family of domains is, uh, it has fixed volume. Okay. So the eigenvalue problem that we are going to consider for this talk is the following eigenvalue uh, problem. So I'm taking the P Laplacian, uh, where I will explain what this P Laplacian is. So the P Laplace operator, uh, when it acts on U, it is uh, exactly this particular differential operator, where P is between one and infinity. 
notice that when p is equal to 2 the p laplacian is the linear operator familiar linear operator namely the laplacian but in general for any other p it's a non linear operator and uh, i will start with this uh, uh, family of domains where i have a bigger ball and i am uh, taking out a uh, closure of a smaller ball from it so it's a punctured domain where there are two disk uh, the inner disk is uh, uh, removed from the outer disk and uh, we are in the setting of a riemannian manifold for convenience you can assume that we are in the euclidean domain uh, so yeah so a real number lambda is called an eigen value of this eigen value problem which we just saw if it's it's a non constant function belonging to the appropriate sobolev space such that the following uh, integral inequality holds for every test function w in the same uh, sobolev space so this is what i will call lambda will be an eigen value for the uh, boundary value problem that we just saw if this uh, equality holds for every w in the uh, in w1p omega okay so yeah and la by lambda 1 omega i would mean the first or the smallest positive eigen value of this eigen value problem so it has the following variational characterization that it is given by the infimum of this quotient where this u is again uh, running over this the same space non zero functions in the sobolev space okay and we know that this eigen value is simple uh, so the eigen function corresponding to this eigen value doesn't change sign so without loss of generality uh, we assume that uh, y1 omega is the eigen function corresponding to this lambda 1 omega uh, we can choose it to be positive uh, and of unit lp norm because uh, eigen space is one dimensional so we can just uh, get hold of one eigen function which satisfies uh, this property okay so uh, keshavan and ram shiv kumar and even earlier harsh uh, harsh had proved it only for the two dimensional euclidean uh, plane uh, so in the euclidean case and for the linear case that is for p equal to 2 it was already known that the, that the first dirichlet eigen value lambda 1 attains its maximum if and only if the balls, so we have two balls, right? The outer ball and the inner ball. So the inner ball is free to move inside the outer ball. The radii of both these balls are constant. So the radii are not changing. That is the volume of the domain is fixed, but the center of the inner ball and uh, because of which the entire inner ball is free to move inside the outer ball. So among all, the, all uh, these domains, family of domains, when the two balls are concentric, as I had said earlier in the talk, that in most of the cases, the most con most uh, symmetric configuration in the admissible family of domains turns out to be the one for which the cost functional is extremum. So even in this case, the first Dirichlet eigenvalue uh, is maximum if and only if these two balls are concentric. So, so, so what, uh, what does it optimize here? So the, when the first pair gets eigenvalue, maximum when yeah so when what i'm trying to say is uh, uh, i want to draw it uh, uh, huh? i want to draw it yes, Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, I have. Oh, no, no, that was fine. So I have a bigger uh, disk. Okay, uh, just. Okay, and I have a smaller disk inside it. And uh, as I move, so this is one configuration and as the center of the, uh, of, the of this uh, smaller ball uh, changes from this point to some other point, for example, then the new domain is this. 
right? So I have all this collection of domains where uh, the radii of both, I mean, the ball is the same, only the inner ball, I'm just moving inside the outer ball. So these are two different configurations in my family of admissible domains. And this is uh, the most symmetric configuration where both these balls are concentrated. They have the same center. OK, this is one more configuration. And I am saying that among all these configurations, the lambda one for this, so this is the omega star that we were looking for. So lambda one of this omega star is uh, less than or equal to its maximum. So it's greater than or equal to lambda one of omega for every omega in my family of admissible domains. That F. OK, what I just understand was physically to what it corresponds, what the not to I mean, so the volume is constant, so it's just, uh, okay, anyways. The eigen value yeah, changes yeah. with the shape of the domain. Yeah, and I understand that. If you want to interpret physically, so physically how do you understand then that? the eigenvalue. Uh, in this case. No, so the value I... is, if you look at uh, the diffusion from this domain, peak diffusion, then the exponential of minus lambda one p is the rate of diffusion or dissipation. And so so you're trying to see for what shape the dissipation is the, yes. is the least. And also, you, I mean, when you play the drum, uh, like when it's the lambda one is the bass tone of the, of the sound that will come out from playing that drum. So, uh, for which shape will it be minimum or maximum matters in such cases? For the presentation? Yes, thanks. Okay, I think wait, we need to wait, go back. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Uh, no, I want to go to the previous slide. I'm not sure what I have covered everything. Yeah. Okay, yes. Mm. OK, yeah, so that was for the Euclidean space and it was for P equal to two. Then uh, with my PhD advisor, Professor Aithan, we generalized this result to all the three space forms. So from uh, the constant zero curvature to complete uh, uh, simply connected, complete Riemannian manifolds of constant sectional curvature, namely the SN and HN, the hyperbolic space and the sphere. Uh, we generalized these results over there. And then with uh, Professor Vemuri, we generalized these results to rank one symmetric spaces of non-compact type. So from constant sectional curvature to uh, Riemannian manifolds, where the curvature tensor is uh, covariantly invariant. That is the, uh, it, it is invariant under the parallel transport. That was a natural generalization to this, but we could not generalize it to all the rank one symmetric spaces only uh, for the non-compact type because there was a nice damek ricci uh, 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 hyperbolic H type uh, uh, spaces uh, formalism available, which was useful in uh, carrying out the deformation. And, uh, and uh, in the uh, previous proofs, there was something called a reflection technique, which was used. And because of the constant curvature manifolds, the reflection worked just like in the Euclidean space, but when the curvature is not constant, the reflection technique uh, does not work the way we expect it to work, but we can use the isometry of the symmetric spaces, namely the geodesic inversion. That is ge by geodesic inversion, meaning suppose I have a point P and there is a geodesic uh, passing through P such that gamma, geodesic gamma passing through P such that gamma of zero is P. Then, then when I uh, inverse, invert this geodesic, that is if I take gamma T, going to gamma minus t, okay, Maybe which sure which fixes. Yeah, but it's the code is easier. Yes, so I have a point P and there is a geodesic. Uh, this is the gamma of zero, which is P, and this is gamma of T. So a map F, which takes gamma T to gamma minus T. So clearly it fixes the point P. And if I reverse the geodesic, that is now my gamma T becomes gamma of minus T. 
So Uh, so this is like geo reversing the geodesic. So suppose I have a ball like this and there is a geodesic, then the P is fixed, but any vector in the tangent plane uh, start uh, at gamma zero will just go to uh, minus of that vector. That is on the tangent space on TPM, uh, this function acts as a minus identity uh, map. So it takes my V to minus V. Okay, so this for a symmetric space, this map F, is an isometry of the Riemannian manifold. And instead of reflecting uh, a point, we just invert uh, that point with respect to uh, a given point. P. And this is true for every P on the Riemannian manifold. So this is what we will uh, do. I mean, if others are interested, maybe after the talk, I can explain more. But this will not be used in the proof that I am planning to cover in this talk. Okay, let's go back to the yeah then uh, with rajesh we generalize these results from the linear operator laplacian to the uh, non linear operator p laplacian for each p between 1 and infinity and uh, here uh, uh, we proved that lambda 1 is maximum uh, for the concentric ball uh, but we could not prove that this is the unique maximum. So we could only prove the non-strict monotonicity for the lambda one. In the earlier cases, I forgot to mention that for the concentric ball, uh, lambda one was maximum. And as the center of the smaller ball moves uh, towards the boundary of the ball along the radius of the ball. Okay, so uh, Ravi, can I go back? To draw? Yes. Yeah, so this concentric was where the maximum of lambda one was uh, happening. And as this center of this ball is moving along this radius of the ball, so uh, let T denote the distance between the, uh, these two centers of the bigger ball and the smaller ball. When they are not concentric, your T will be positive. So this T is the di uh, distance between uh, these two balls. Then uh, it so happens because Laplacian uh, uh, is invariant under the isometry of the domain. This lambda one of uh, T uh, will be the same uh, no matter in which direction you are moving. Uh, it just depends on the distance between the two centers. Even if I move along the Y axis or the X axis or any other arbitrary axis passing through the origin. So without loss of generality, I can assume that the center of the bigger ball is the origin. Then uh, lambda one is just a function of this one variable t, which is the distance between those two balls. And so it, it, it just boils down to uh, study the behavior of this lambda one. When my uh, smaller ball is moving along a radius of the bigger ball and uh, lambda one of zero is maximum. And as my t increases, my lambda one of t is a strictly decreasing function in the linear case when p is equal to two. But with Rajesh, uh, uh, okay, we generalize this result uh, to the P Laplacian, but that strict monotonicity we did not have. Oh, how do I go back to the previous slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we did not have the strict back back. I think this is the one. Yes. Like, yeah. Okay, yeah, so we did not have the uh, strict monotonicity, but we did have uh, monotonicity and the critical point we definitely had over there. Okay, so other generalizations uh, with another PhD student at TIFR CAM, uh, we generalize, uh, not generalize, but for P equal to two, we proved a similar result for another family of domains where the outer domain was still a ball, but inner uh, domain, which we are removing from the outer domain, was no longer a ball, but it was, an, uh, it was a domain having certain uh, symmetry properties. So uh, in this case, I will show you with pictures what are the uh, examples of this family of domains. So this P has dihedral symmetry, that is it has N many axes of symmetry. 
where all the axes of symmetry meet in a unique uh, point in the interior of P. So examples are square, ellipse, then regular hexagon, regular pentagon, and so on. But with show, sorry, we could prove it only for D N symmetry, uh, where N was even. Uh, for N odd, we did get partial results, but we could not completely solve it then for N equal to odd. Uh, and so when I, though I'm saying square, I mean uh, something similar to square with rounded corners because we are not allowing uh, uh, domains which do not have C2 boundary. So in this case, we could prove that lambda one is optimum when an axis of symmetry of this uh, domain that we are removing from B coincides with the diameter of B. OK, so I'm only so uh, there is this when is emphasized here. So it says when it doesn't say only when. So this is like existence of uh, optimizer, but not a uniqueness. That means again, uh, there is no strict monotonicity. I will uh, when I saw you uh, show you the figures, I will explain this uh, in a better way. And uh, in the n equal to even case, a complete characterization of which configuration is the maximizing configuration and which configuration is the minimizing configuration. It has been done and between maximizing and minimizing, there is a strict monotonicity strictly decreasing from maximizing to minimizing then strictly increasing from minimizing to maximizing. And it's a periodic function like that. And uh, monotonicity of lambda one between two consecutive maximizing and minimizing configurations is also obtained. So let us see in this case. So this is one configuration. I have a disk. I am removing a, a, a domain which has D4 symmetry. OK, and these two are non concentric. That means the center of the ball. So by the center of this uh, domain with uh, dihedral symmetry, I mean the unique point where all the axes of symmetry of the square are meeting. So this, the center of the square and the center of the ball, they are not concent uh, not the same. And now I am rotating this square about its own center. So this is one configuration where uh, the axis of symmetry of the square is coinciding with the diameter of the ball. This is another configuration where again an axis of symmetry of the of the P is coinciding with the diameter of the ball. But this one we are calling it off configuration and that one we are calling it on configuration. And uh, the in the off configuration, so when you look at this square, there is an in. Uh, uh, if you look at the, can I draw it and show? There is something called in circle and outer circle of. A, so if I have a square because it has a dihedral symmetry, there is a unique center and there is, will be a largest circle contained inside the square which I will be call I will be calling as the in circle. And also there is a smallest circle or smallest ball. Containing the square and this is something uh, they all all these three uh, domains have the same center. This is something which I will call as the outer circle or out circle. OK, and the point of intersection of the in circle and my square, they will be called in vertices. And the point of intersection of the outer circle and the uh, and the square is something which I will call it outer vertices. OK, so in the on configuration and off configuration that we have. So here the inner vertices, pair of opposite inner vertices, they are along the diameter of the disk. And then the pair of opposite outer vertices are along the diameter of the disk. So the diameter of the disk here too. So this is what I will call it on configuration and off configuration. And if I rotate it by pi by four, this square uh, about the center of the square, then uh, pi by four plus pi by four. If I keep rotating, I will move from off to on, on to off, off to on, on to off. And we will see that it becomes lambda one as a function of this theta, where theta is the angle of rotation, becomes a periodic function. And lambda one has critical points exactly at 
the integer multiples of pi by 4 and between uh, 0 and pi by 4 it is a uh, strictly monotone function pi by 4 to pi by 2 it is a strictly monotone function and so on so it increases then decreases so this is what uh, when i rotate the square uh, the original axis of symmetry of the square which was a, which was the x axis earlier now becomes a rotated axis which makes the angle uh, t or theta whatever you like uh, with the positive x axis and the new domain new square i will call it pt and the new domain which is b minus pt is something i will call it uh, call as omega t and uh, so this is for n equal to odd these are the configurations which will be calling it off configuration these are the configurations which will be calling it on as on configurations and for n equal to even these are also valid uh, domains because they also have uh, dihedral symmetry and also uh, between two consecutive of axis of symmetry the distance between uh, the center the distance between uh, from the center to the boundary between two consecutive axis of symmetry is a monotonic function as a function of the argument okay so these are uh, uh, this star shaped domain is also a valid uh, obstacle for us so uh, in all these cases we have proved that so remember in the previous case we had when but here we have only when that means we also could prove the uniqueness so we proved that lambda one is optimum only when an axis of symmetry of p coincides with the diameter of d complete characterization of maximizing and minimizing domains for each n larger than or equal to 2 where this is the order of the dihedral symmetry not the dimension of the domain and monotonicity of lambda 1 between two consecutive maximizing and minimizing configurations is also uh, done and uh, uh, so remember this is for the p laplacian so for from p equal to 2 which was done with uh, shovik roy we proved it for uh, any other p but this only when part is pro proved uh, it is not proved for all p between 1 and infinity but it is proved for p larger than 3 by 2 because the strong comparison principle which we used uh, due to skionzi who proved it in 2014 in the year 2014 we used it and that is uh, applicable only uh, for p larger than 3 by 2 uh, uh, onwards <clears throat> but for other p's we we do have the when part of the result that is we have monotonicity but we do not have strict monotonicity and the critical points are still the same and also as an application of this result uh, there was this uh, conjecture of Paine uh, who conjectured in I think 1967 that the nodal set for lambda 2 for the Laplacian case uh, cannot be a closed curve which was proved later for domains with some symmetry and convexity properties and later there were some counter examples to the conjecture so ruling out some uh, properties for the nodal uh, domains uh, also caught attention of many mathematicians so as an application of this result the maximizing and minimizing configurations and the monotonicity property we could prove that the moment your outer domain is a disk and your inner domain is uh, p satisfying all those properties that i said dihedral symmetry and uh, between two consecutive axes of symmetry the boundary distance from the center of the square to the boundary of the square is a monotonic function of the argument and all those the, all you can just keep the pictures in mind for all those domains the nodal domain or the nodal line uh, cannot be uh, cannot have the same order of uh, dihedral symmetry as that of p uh, there is some some uh, possibility that we rule out for the nodal line of the second eigen function okay second eigen function uh, has multiplicity 2 so there will be two nodal sets uh, uh, divided by a, a nodal line so uh, so suppose your p is not in an off configuration and your nodal line uh, cannot be uh, in the on configuration with p that is something that we rule out as an application of this okay so as i mentioned that this works only for p uh, larger than 3 by 2 uh, and as I mentioned, we use the strong comparison principle due to skewanzi. 
this paper gives a direct and simpler proof for of the strict monotonicity as compared to the one which was given by Anub Sasi and Bobkov. And this proof also extends the result obtained, uh, uh, which we obtained with uh, Rajesh. And for P between 1 and 3 by 2, we obtained the non-strict monotonicity, that is the when part, uh, using the same uh, weak comparison principle, which is available in uh, uh, our joint work with Rajesh and uh, his former student, uh, Francisco Toledo. Uh, then monotonicity result for this lambda 1, implies that for this, uh, as I told you, uh, for this uh, range, then it gives some property that the nodal set for second eigenfunction cannot hold certain property. And uh, to the best of our knowledge. Can you tell me what is the nodal set? So nodal set, so yeah, can I go back to the drawing page? Board, huh? Yes. Okay, so uh, the so we spoke about lambda one. So after lambda one, uh, there is lambda two, okay, which has multiplicity two. So lambda two and lambda the next lambda one will also also be the same value. Lambda three will be same as lambda two and so on. So the uh, because the multiplicity is two, the eigen function changes time uh, changes sign. So on some part of the domain. Uh, for example, if this is my uh, uh, domain, and suppose I take Laplacian u is equal to lambda u in omega, and u is equal to zero on the boundary of omega, uh, then it changes sign. So at some part it will be positive, and some part it will be negative. So where it is separated, the positive and the negative, it separates. That that will be a curve. It will it will be a major zero set. So suppose for example. I mean, I'm just drawing. I am not sure uh, whether this will be. This is the nodal line, but there will be this nodal line, uh, which I will call it N U, where my U is zero. So uh, there is some uh, there is some set on which my U is equal to zero, and uh, it separates my domain into two components. On one component, U will be positive; other component, U will be negative, and it it will pass through that U equal to zero set like that. So Pioneer had conjectured that. Uh, this curve, the nodal set, cannot be a closed curve. Okay, and uh, then it was proved for certain domains, and it was disproved. Counter examples were given for certain other domains. So we are also in our work. We are also ruling out uh, the possibility that the nodal set can be of certain type, like that. So it's just an application of this. So it is just to see the geometry of the how the eigen function behaves. Okay, uh, so to, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first result regarding the geometry of the nodal set of a second eigenfunction for doubly connected planar domains. For simply connected domains, there were multiple results in the past uh, other than the domains bounded by two spheres. So for the domains bounded by two spheres, it was already considered by uh, Anoop and uh, also independently by one of his co collaborators. I don't remember the name now. But this domains bounded by two spheres, it was recently done. And uh, also in this paper, we also proved the conjecture we had with uh, uh, the PhD student Shavik Roy, which was uh, pending for n equal to odd case and p equal to two case. Uh, that was something which was uh, which we could not prove earlier, but that was settled in this paper. OK, how much time do I have? So in the proof, there are uh, multiple steps. 15 minutes. OK, yeah, so uh, there is shape differentiation. There is a rotating plane method and. Uh, uh, yeah, so what was can I go back? Yeah, and the comparison theorems, right? So OK. So as omega goes to omega t by this transformation, either we are moving the circle or rotating the square, square or whatever, my omega is changing to omega t under the action of the vector field or I'm perturbing my domain. 
then the eigen function the moment the domain changes the solution to the differential equation changes so what whatever was my y1 initially that changes to my y1 t or in other words the first eigen function corresponding to omega t and uh, this is something which is not uh, relevant to this group but yeah so y1 y1 see for y1 the domain is omega t which is different for different t so i am just pulling it back by composing the phi t which is the uh, uh, flow for the vector field that we are using so that this y bar upper t always have the same uh, initial domain uh, just for convenience we use this new notation and uh, as uh, as my t is changing and the domain is changing my lambda one is also changing with respect to t and it so happens that this t going to lambda one t is a differentiable map uh, and uh, there is an expression for the derivative of this lambda one with respect to t which is of this form <coughs> these are referred to as the hadamard perturbation formula the celebrated uh, hadamard perturbation formula which as you can see it depends on the vector field b which is responsible for the perturbation how do we say that uh, wait. yeah and it uh, depends on this nt which is the outward normal to the domain so in other words it depends on the shape of the domain and it depends on this outward normal uh, derivative of the solution uh, so sorry i should have used y because uh, y is the solution so this should have been y1 so it also depends on the normal derivative of the solution on the boundary so in other words it depends on how my uh, eigen function behaves near the boundary of the obstacle as i exit from the domain to the exterior of the domain near the boundary of the domain how my eigen function behaves that also plays a role in determining the behavior of this lambda one okay so we use this rotating plane method so in the in the earlier proofs when we had two disk we were just translating the disk and uh, the uh, uh, there was some plane with respect to which we were taking reflection and that plane was just translating so earlier it was called a, a moving plane method but since our planes are rotating because the axis of symmetry of the obstacle uh, the moment we change so what we will do uh, this axis of symmetry of the obstacle divides our domain into many sectors the shaded regions so sector 1 between the zeroth axis and the first axis i will call it sigma 0 1 sigma 0 2 sigma 0 3 sigma 0 4 and so on okay so then what we do is we reflect the first sector with respect to this axis so that it completely lies in the second sector and we compare the value of the eigen function in order to get uh, so uh, if we go back to the previous slide see here we just want to find the critical points of lambda 1 so we need to find where my when my lambda 1 will be zero and when what is the sign of lambda 1 prime t between two, two consecutive critical points that is what we are interested in <laughs> and because of the symmetry of the domain and we know that this eigen value is invariant under the isometry of the domain it is clear that the multiples of pi by 4 in the in the case of a square because by by rotating by uh, pi by 4 rotating by pi by 2 you you come back to the same configuration right and they are isometric to each other so we know that there is a periodicity because lambda 1 is invariant under isometry and also lambda 1 of minus t will be the same as lambda 1 of plus t because reflection when you take reflection in the anti clockwise direction by an angle t or when you take the reflection in the clockwise direction by an angle t those two configurations are isometric to each other and hence the eigen value will be the same and it's a differentiable function even differentiable function so zero is a critical point and because of the periodicity there are k pi by n where n is the order of the dihedral symmetry they will also be critical points so it boils down to find the sign of lambda 1 prime t only between zero and pi by n so in case of a square between zero and pi by 4 and uh, so we divide this boundary of pt into those sectors that i uh, showed here 
So boundary of PT will now be just the union of all these small, small pieces. And this piece will go after reflection to this piece. This piece will go after reflection about this axis to the next piece and so on. So we combine uh, all these things and we do the corresponding pairing. I will not have time to go through the complete proof. But uh, uh, yeah, so then we compare the values and we apply uh, in the linear case, we were applying uh, the maximum principle. So let me quickly recall the maximum principles that we apply in the linear case. So suppose you have a differential operator like this, linear differential operator, and you know where your AIJs are uh, nice coefficients and you are talking about a C1 omega bar solution <coughs> to uh, this uh, differential inequality uh, sub solution. Then it says that uh, suppose you know that U is bounded above by M in omega and there exists some point on the boundary of omega where the maximum is attained. And suppose that boundary point is nice enough. That is, it has some interior sphere condition. If it is nice enough, that boundary point, then the function del u by del n at that particular x naught will be strictly positive. That is, uh, it, when you exit the domain from that point, it it is it cannot be a plateau-like situation. It will be a strictly increasing function at the point of maximum. Okay, unless you have a constant uh, solution. Okay, so this this was the Hoff lemma in the linear case. In the non-linear case, there is this uh, result by Schionzi, which says that suppose your G is a locally Lipschitz function, uh, which is positive for positive uh, x, and you have U and V, uh, C1 omega bar functions, satisfying this in inequality inside omega, Assume that either U or V is a non-negative solution of uh, this differential equation corresponding to G. Uh, and your P is between 2N plus 2 upon N plus 2. So for us, N is equal to 2. So our P, uh, when we apply Skunzi's result, uh, just uh, becomes bigger than 3 by 2. Then there we were talking about maximum. Here we are talking about comparing U and V. So then if u and v have this relation that v v always dominates u in a connected subdomain omega prime in omega then v will strictly dominate u inside omega prime unless they are identically equal so from maximum comparing with the maximum value here we are comparing two different uh, uh, functions where one of uh, one of it is a non negative solution and the other one is just uh, satisfies uh, this particular inequality. So it's a comparison principle which we apply here. OK, and the weak comparison principle which was there in uh, our paper uh, with uh, Toledo and Rajesh uh, uh, stated this, that if omega is a Lipschitz domain in Rn, uh, where the dimension is larger than or equal to 2, and u and v are two different, uh, u and v are C1 omega bar functions, which are non-negative weak solutions of this on omega uh, for some p between one and infinity. Then if v dominates u on the boundary of omega, then v will dominate u uh, inside omega, everywhere in omega, in omega. And here there is no strict sign. It is less than or equal to it. It is not saying that v strictly dominates u. So this is weak comparison principle. And the result by Q and Z is a strong comparison principle because we could conclude that V is strictly uh, greater than U. And furthermore, at the boundary point, this is like the uh, something uh, analogous to the Hoff lemma. At the boundary point, if U and V are coincide and they become zero, uh, because my U and V are non-negative, so when they become zero, that is the extremum value for this U and V. In this case, you can compare the normal derivative of uh, V and U. So this was the weak comparison principle which we applied to get the weaker result. OK, I, uh, I, this all, I already explained all these things. So the result is uh, like uh, we want to find lambda 1 minimum and lambda 1 maximum among this family of domains. All these things I already explained. This also I explained. So this is the statement of the result. The fundamental Dirichlet eigenvalue lambda 1 of omega t, where omega t belongs to this family of admissible domain, 
is optimal for precisely for those t for which an axis of symmetry of the of the domain in inner domain coincides with the diameter of b the maximizing configurations are the ones corresponding to those t for which this pt is an on position with respect to b and the minimizing configuration are the ones corresponding to those t for which the pt is in an off position with respect to b and uh, so this k pi by n are the critical points and as i told you it was enough to study the behavior of the uh, lambda 1 prime between 0 and pi by n there it is strictly positive okay these are some numerical evidence supporting when we rotate how the eigen values change and there is a tabular uh, plot of this. So off position, it's minimum. Then as you keep rotating, it uh, increases, becomes maximum when it is in the on configuration, then decreases and again becomes minimum when you reach the off configuration. And there is this symmetry also uh, because it becomes a periodic function of theta. And these are some list of relevant References. Okay, thank you. Is there questions? Yes. Do you know what that is? If P is not connected, for example, if you leave out two balls of the same area in the initial ball. Yeah, but that is a more complicated problem because it will no longer be a function of one variable now. But there are some results uh, for that also. For uh, Can I go back to the drawing? So there is there are papers uh, in those direction too. And there is a paper by Harrell Kroger Kurata, which is there, this one, this paper, uh, where they prove that. So suppose you have a bigger disk. And you have a smaller disk, uh, multiple disk need not be just two. It could be more than two. Then uh, the maximizing configurations uh, is the one where both these disk. So he is defining something as the heart of the domain. So there is there will be some part of the outer disk where it will be which which he is defining as the heart of the domain. And he says that the maximizing configurations is when both these disks are uh, in the heart of the domain. And the minimizing configuration is where all these uh, these two balls need not be of the same size. So they say when when both these balls touch each other and touch the boundary of the outer outer disk like this. So this will be the minimizing configuration. And he rules out which can't be the maximizing configuration. Like he says, if there is a hyperplane of interior reflection passing through the center of one of the obstacles then that cannot be the maximizing. So he rules out, but there is no complete uh, uh, characterization of the maximizing configuration, but it says they have to lie in the heart of the domain. And uh, minimizing will be when all of them touch each other and touch the boundary like that. Okay. Um, do your results only apply in dimension two, for example? Do you um, only the, the, for example, the dihedral domain? Yes, only, only, yes only because we are using the polar coordinates and the polar representation of the domains. Mm -hmm. So it applies only for dimension two. So, for example, if, if you move to dimension three, you yes. also get something similar, no? A function we of can say from the two-dimensional case that if you take a cross-section of this higher dimensional this thing, and if that cross-section has this diagonal symmetry, so suppose you have a cube, then yeah. you can cut the cube into a, a cross-section such that it becomes a square. Right. So you can say that along this particular plane, planar cross-section of the domain, if you rotate the higher dimensional obstacle inside the bigger disk, then we can say Application of this says that there is some behavior like this, okay. but totally in any rotation of the three dimensional cube, for example, uh, uh, we might not be able to calculate. And you made the numerics is just a starting now. The, so result, what, the results, he saw something like that for the three dimension is just a starting now. The numerics. Yeah. Okay. So for the theory, I think it's still more hard. Okay. 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 Okay
Okay. Yeah, because it's similar to the then you get a function of more <coughs> values, no? I imagine. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, depends upon. I mean, you can just uh, have the perturbation in one particular direction to just restrict your attention to a function of one variable. Okay. But there are so many deformations possible in higher dimensions. And if you uh, like the uh, natural ge generalization of a square will be a cube. Right. And the cube can be rotated in so many directions, right? right. So then it becomes uh, a more uh, complex. Uh, but our proof relies on polar coordinate representation of the boundary, uh, which we haven't tried it for higher dimension. Like we haven't generalized it for that. Thank you. Um, I have some te technical questions, but I keep it for a private. Okay. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much for your thank best you very talk. Much. Let's ask it. Nobody has a question from the audience, Javier, Soraya, Aditi. No questions. Thanks. Nice. Talk. Okay. So let's stop here. Yes. Okay.